Okay, thanks, Carlo. Can you hear me? Yes. So I guess I can skip uh, expressing my deep gratitude to the organizers. <laughs> and uh, I'll uh, start with some words of motivation for this course, which is about black holes and quantum gravity, or maybe better, semi-classical quantum gravity. So, as we all know, general relativity is a very nice theory. But since it has a dimensionful coupling constant, seen as a quantum field theory, is non-renormalizable. So this, by no means, can be complete, considered our UV-complete theory of quantum gravity. So this can be seen as a low-energy effective theory, which will be corrected as soon as we start approaching the Planck uh, uh, length that is uh, governing this, uh, this, uh, this action. So let's say I have my UV complete theory here. This is not renormalizable. It should be seen as an effective low energy theory. UV complete theory. Okay, and somehow we ask how these two theories are connected. So we don't know yet what is the UV complete theory of quantum gravity, but we believe string theory is a very good candidate. After all, laces is another name for strings, so if we are here, that's what we believe. So let's say string theory. And we would like to know how this theory gets corrected and uh, how the two theories are related. So on the one hand, uh, consistency with the low energy uh, measurements, the low energy experience we have, puts some constraints on the UV complete theory. So there is some interplay between these two theories. On the other hand, uh, the UV complete theory, if it's a good candidate for describing our world, we have to reproduce the, uh, the physics that we measure at low energies. So of course, there is a strong interplay between these two theories. And uh, so we would like to explore these kind of questions using black holes. So why do we want to use black holes for this scope? After all, we know that black holes are entirely classical objects. They are solutions of the classical Einstein equations. So a priori, they have nothing to do with the quantum world. But we will see, most of you probably know, but uh, we will slowly get into that. We will see that uh, black holes exhibit uh, some thermodynamic behavior. And this is the first hint that uh, they can say something about uh, the UV complete theory, or at least about the corrections to uh, general relativity. So although they appear as classical solutions to the Einstein equations, they have some particular behavior that, uh, that uh, is consistent with the laws of thermodynamics. So thermodynamics usually arises as a coarse-grained uh, as coarse-grained physics, starting from some microscopic description. Think about the thermodynamics of some gases. This can be described, derived, using the kinetic theory of gases. And similarly, we would like to describe the physics of black holes, that is, uh, expressing the laws of thermodynamics uh, using some microscopic description that will have to be derived from the UV complete theory. Vice versa, this, this fact that uh, the, at, low, at uh, low di long distances and low energies, the physics, uh, um, gravitational physics has some thermodynamic behavior, puts some constraints on the UV complete theory. So again, we want to play with this interplay using black holes. So an important hint that black hole thermodynamics is, uh, is, uh, has something to do with quantum gravity comes, of course, from the celebrated bekenstein hawking formula that we all know, but that we will derive and describe in this course. So 
So what does the formula say? It gives the, en the entropy of a black hole in terms of its area. But let's write it fully. It's not just uh, the Boltzmann constant times the area over 4. We have some other units. We have G Newton, of course. Then we also have C cube and some H bar. I guess that's all. And we see, first of all, this is one of the most beautiful formulae in physics because in a very simple and compact, for, compact formula, it incorporates all the fundamental constants of nature. We have a special relativity that is associated with the speed of light, uh, gravity associated with the Newton's constant. The Boltzmann uh, constant refers to some statistics. Of course, the entropy is a thermodynamical quantity. And uh, A is the area of the horizon. It refers to some geometry. So we will need somehow to use uh, all these uh, notions to understand the formula. And most of all, you see, we have h bar here. So even if uh, black hole thermodynamics is in, derived within, quantum, uh, within classical general relativity, we will see that uh, some semi-classical reasoning brings the, some h bar here. And so it's the first hint that we need also to include quantum effects to understand the formula. So just this is a very simple observation. And OK, this can also be expressed just for completeness in this way, where LP is the Planck length, and uh, uh, which is, uh, let me write it here. OK. So there must be something related to the Planck length here. Otherwise, we couldn't uh, match the units. So it's as simple as that. OK, we can be more concrete and formulate a problem that is what we would, we would like ultimately to solve, is that in statistical mechanics, the entropy is expressed as the logarithm of the number of the degeneracy of states uh, of a certain system with some associated charges. So let's say we have a bunch of charges, electric charges, angular momentum, other quantities, the number of microstates with, with that assigned charge uh, gives us the entropy. So it's a degeneracy of some microscopic system. So given that black holes have a, an entropy, we would like to understand what is the microscopic system that can uh, provide uh, the microstates that uh, enter in this formula. So this is somehow the ultimate question we want to ask because, of course, uh, understanding this microscopic system requires understanding somehow quantum gravity, or at least some aspects of quantum gravity. So this is what is called microstate counting. Uh, as you see in the outline of the course, it comes at the end. But we will, we will try to say something about that. So yeah, some other remarks that uh, give us even more motivation for studying this is that uh, you see this formula has some surprising feature because uh, the entropy we are used uh, to say that this k is like the volume of some of our physical system, but here what enters, what appears is the area. So it's, it, this means that somehow the gravitational degrees of freedom are stored in one dimension less than what, you are, than what you are, we are using to. And this was, uh, even historically, the, the first hint of the holographic principle that was later developed uh, into the uh, ADS-CFT correspondence into string theory, but it has also many other applications. And uh, uh, on the other hand, we can say that uh, these modern tools, such as ADS-CFT correspondence, or more generally holography, can give us new tools for studying this formula, because somehow we have more uh, new formalism, well, not, not so new anymore, but still under investigation formalism for uh, understanding the black hole entropy. So these are all good motivations for uh, studying this. And as I said, we will get to the microstate counting only towards the end. The focus of the course will be mostly on seeing how the black hole thermodynamics arises in GR, and then trying to do some further semi-classical reasoning for uh, exploring these questions that are in between here and then slowly uh, get into microstate counting with a little bit of ADI-CFT just towards the end. So in order to also to understand how fast I can be on this first part, 
I would like to know how many of you have already seen some black hole thermodynamics in some detail at least, if you can raise your hands, say roughly half, half of you, okay? And uh, at least are you familiar with differential forms uh, and all this? Hopefully, yes. So I can, I'll try to be a bit quick in the first part, uh, although I will review all this stuff here. Uh, maybe for some of you, of you this will be boring, but just bear with me. There are many other things to discuss. Any questions about this? Of course, don't hesitate to interrupt me at any time and ask. Okay, let's start with some basics, some preliminary stuff. For today, I'm not ambitious. I will not try to answer any of these questions. I will just try to review some basic stuff in GR differential geometry. And uh, tomorrow, tomorrow we will discuss black hole thermodynamics. So some ba basic stuff. Well, first, uh, some conventions I have to. Uh, one thing, if you want to take uh, notes, that's uh, good, but I will provide some LaTeX notes, uh, hopefully in the next few days. So you don't need to write everything. So conventions, uh, we start by saying that uh, although I've written uh, the fundamental constants uh, before, often we will set them to one, to one as it's natural and uh, common. When this is not the case, I will mention it. Uh, then the space-time metric will be always the one that is good for general relativity. The conventions on the Riemann curvature are the following. So two covariant anti-symmetrization or two covariant derivatives acting on any vector will give us the Riemann tensor. I think this is the same convention that Marco Zagerman used. And from this, we can express the Riemann tensor in terms of the Christoffel symbols. Ricci tensor is uh, obtained uh, with a different sign from what was used in the supergravity course. I contract the first and third index. And then the Ricci scalar is just the contraction of the Ricci tensor as usual. So all this may be good if you want to check the computations that I will discuss. Of course, these are the, say, I would say, natural conventions in uh, GR. Then we want to discuss some differential forms. Some, we'll remind you of some formula that will be useful for us. So let's take a d-dimensional manifold. Most of the time for us, d will be 4. But uh, OK, let's keep it general for now. And uh, this is endowed with the matrix g mu nu. And we introduce, when I will write the antisymmetric tensor, I will really mean the antisymmetric tensor. So it is epsilon mu 1 mu d. And it is the tensor. So it is such that epsilon 0, 1, d is the square root of the, model, the determinant of the matrix. And this satisfies some useful relation that we will use at some point. Let me write it here so that I don't write it again.
So when we contract uh, D minus P indices, we get uh, some signs, some combinatorial factors, and a delta. So T here is the number of uh, time-like directions for us, it will be one. But when we are in Euclidean signature, this doesn't get the minus sign. So are this, is this familiar stuff, I guess so, yeah. So, so T equals zero is a Riemannian manifold, T equal one is Lorentzian manifold. Uh, P forms will be denoted with the one of the P factorial. Okay, and uh, I define the Hodge dual of a P form as follows. There, are, there is a sign that must be specified in these conventions, and I do this. Okay, so I first contract the, the tensor with uh, the anti-symmetric tensor, and then uh, we have the differentials coming after. Um, there is a relation that the Hodge dual satisfies. It's, uh, uh, I go on here. When we apply it twice, it gives it's almost the identity, but uh, there are always some signs that depend on the space-time signature and uh, on the degree of the form. Yes. And another relation that we will need very soon is a combination of odd stars and uh, exterior derivative that gives us bunch of signs <coughs> so this operation gives us a p minus 1 form and uh, it's uh, basically the, the way to express the divergence of the form. You see the divergence here. But uh, we need to keep track of the signs when we want to do precise things. So if you want to do this gymnastic, it's always useful and we will need it later. So this is as far as differential, uh, some basic conventions on differential forms are concerned. <coughs> Let's now recall what the Stokes theorem says. So given our d-dimensional manifold with the boundary dm, so we have a, bound, a manifold m with the boundary dm, and the p minus 1 form, sorry, d minus 1 form, omega, the Stokes theorem tells us that the integral of d omega over m is the same as the integral over the boundary of omega. And uh, this is uh, useful to derive in an easy way conservation laws. Let's see how. So let's assume that our space-time is foliated by space-like surfaces, hypersurfaces. Um, so we fix for each surface, each hypersurface is specified by fixing the time. So we have a slicing of the space-time by 
surfaces of fixed time. Uh, so we have sigma t1 here, sigma t2 here. The space time is the interior of this. So this is the boundary. So we have that uh, the boundary of M is uh, sigma t1 given by sigma t1 and sigma t2. We consider the, the manifold that is uh, in between these two. And uh, we would like to express uh, a conservation law. So let's consider the, a conserved current. Let's consider a conserved current. This is a conserved current. Using what I just wrote above, it, this can also be expressed in differential form notation. If we introduce a one form, it is uh, uh, the current with a, a lower, an index lower than using the matrix. So this is my one form current. And then I can say that D star J is zero, is the same as the conservation. Okay. Now, um, a charge. This may be the electric current, but as we will see in a moment, uh, may also be some space-time current that I will introduce. So a charge is defined by the integral over uh, the hypersurfaces at fixed time. So this is a space-like hypersurface that is also called the uh, Cauchy surface uh, of star J. Okay. So but now we want to use the Stokes theorem. Mm, maybe I'll write it here. So we can say that zero is the same as the integral over our manifold of d star j. But this is the same as the integral over the boundary by the Stokes theorem of star j, which is the same as the integral over sigma at time 2 of star j minus the integral of sigma time 1 of star j. The relative minus sign is due to the orientation induced on these surfaces. And uh, this is telling us that uh, the charge at time 1 is the same as the charge at time 2. So this is just expressing the conservation law. So the, conser the local form of the conservation law in differential form notation is this. The integrated form expressed by the, using the Stokes theorem is just that. Okay, let's go on building on this. Uh, this uh, so T1 and T2, of course, can be anything. So this is conserved uh, at any time. So let's apply this, for instance, to the Maxwell equations to see what it gives. So the Maxwell equations uh, is something we will also use. Uh, so we have, of course, the divergence of the field strength is related to the current. And then we have the Bianchi identity. In differential form notation, this is just so I should, in principle, get the signs right. D star f, 4 pi star j, <coughs> and the f is 0. So these are equivalent. And now we see that, uh, uh, OK, Bianchi, of course, implies that f is expressed as the derivative of uh, the gauge potential. The gauge potential is only defined modulo gauge transformations. The Maxwell equation describes the propagation of the electric electromagnetic field, but it also implies the conservation of this current, of course, because d squared is zero, so d star j is zero. Is, uh, zero. Yeah. And uh, let's uh, therefore define the electric charge using uh, what we just learned. <coughs> so the electric charge should be defined if we take a uh, Cauchy surface, sigma again, is defined as star of the electric 
current, but then now I can use the Maxwell equation. Now I use Stokes. Bianchi we don't need anymore. I use Stokes and I arrive here where the sigma is the boundary of this uh, hyper uh, surface, space like hypersurface. And uh, in principle, if we are, for instance, in Minkowski space time, we mean by this, we would mean the boundary at infinity. And uh, so this gives us a definition in, uh, in general relativity of the electric charge. Charges in general relativity are always measured at infinity. Um, so it's, com it's com because we want to measure the charge that is inside the wall space time. But uh, so let's express this uh, specifically for the electric charge and the uh, magnetic charge as well. So we define the conserved electric charge as follows. This is of the space-time, so of the wall space-time. This is 1 over 4 pi. So I, I take uh, an hypersurface, uh, suppose we are in Minkowski space, I take a hypersurface at fixed time, and then I introduce a radial coordinate. I consider the two sphere that is the fixed value of the radial coordinate, and then I con compute this, uh, this integral, and then I send uh, the, radial, the value of the radial coordinate at infinity. So it's uh, the integration over the two sphere at infinity of star f. And similarly, the magnetic charge is defined uh, in this way, 1 over 4 pi. This is the electric charge. This is the magnetic charge. Is this OK? Yeah. Okay, so now let's, uh, we have introduced the charges associated with electromagnetic field. Yeah? So, is there another way of finding magnetic charge if the dimension is different? Uh, no, right, uh, I should have specified, uh, I have written this in the notes, but we didn't say it, is that here we are in D equal 4, otherwise I can introduce the, the electric charge, but this doesn't make sense. So no, I could consider if I have a tree form, I could say I have the flux of the tree form in 5D, for instance. I would need, uh, yeah, I need a D, D minus 2 form. Okay, now since we have introduced the charges associated with electromagnetic field, let's introduce charges associated with space time it's by itself. So that's why I've introduced this machine, because I want to introduce what, what are called the comma integrals and conserve charges associated with the space-time itself. Then we will apply all these to black holes. Okay, here we come back to arbitrary space-time dimension D for this uh, small chapter. So assume we have a killing vector. So we have a symmetry of the space-time. This is needed for defining charges, right? So we have a killing vector K. So 
since the lead derivative of the matrix is zero, uh, this satisfies the Killing equation. Okay, this is the Killing equation. So it is not hard to show that this implies another equation that is this. Do you know what we get roughly when we apply two covariant derivatives on the killing vector? But two covariant derivatives is usually the Riemann tensor. In this case, it is true, even if we don't have anti-symmetrization. This matches this. Ah, okay, I didn't uh, recall the properties of the Riemann tensor. It is anti-symmetric in the first two indices and the second two indices, and symmetric under exchange of the first and second pair of indices. Okay, try to show this as an exercise. It's, uh, the proof is in the notes. It's simple, but if you have not seen it before, it may be useful. So if we contract the mu and rho index, here we get the Ricci tensor. And here we get the divergence of the, uh, sorry, wait a second. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we contract mu and rho. So on the right-hand side, I get uh, the Ricci tensor, nu sigma k sigma, that I just rewrite as a, Let's leave it like that. On the left-hand side, OK, we get the contraction of the mu and rho index. Then we can use this killing uh, equation and exchange two derivatives. So that I end up with the Laplacian acting on the killing vector. Uh, the indices should be like this. Now we can convert this in differential form notations. That's why we introduced all that before. So we have uh, covariant derivatives acting on uh, this one. And uh, you can see, I'll write it up. So we obtain an equation of this type. We had two derivatives on the, on the killing vector. Here we still have two derivatives with the appropriate odd stars to make the contractions right. And here we have a current, J. What I'm aiming at is introducing some conserved current. So this is how we see that. So we have a current that is given by So I introduce the current using the energy momentum tensor of the matter that we have in our space time. And why is this related to that equation? Via the Einstein, Einstein equation. So the Einstein equation can be trace reversed and written in this form. So I use the Einstein equation on the right-hand side and uh, obtain this. On the left-hand side, I had to play with uh, this differential form, a formula that I gave before. So we arrive at this expression. So we see from this 
expression that uh, d star j is zero because I first act with the odd star and I remove this one and then I act with d so d squared is zero. So this is a conserved current. Okay, we have constructed a conserved current starting just from a killing vector in our space time. So we need a symmetry of the space time or at least an asymptotic symmetry because as I said, the charges are, be, are constructed and measured at infinity. So we need that this killing vector exists at least asymptotically. And then we, okay, this, this is the energy momentum tensor of the matter that appears. So let's define the charge. So far we have the conserved current, but we saw how to define a charge. The charge associated with the killing vector K is some constant that we can specify depending on the opportunity. And then we integrate, as before, the, the star of the current. So again, the current is a one form and the hypersurface is a D minus one hypersurface, so everything is fine. We integrate uh, a D minus one form over a D minus one hypersurface. And um, using again the definition of the current that I gave here, this is C over eight pi, the integral over sigma of D star DK. Again, Stokes is helpful. So as before, we will have uh, the boundary of a space-like hypersurface that uh, is again at infinity. And we measure at infinity star of dk, where k <coughs> is not really the vector, but the, ve the one form that I obtain from the vector by lowering the index, right? So here I really mean nothing more than this. This is one form, dk two form, star dk, is good for being measured on del sigma, which is a d minus two uh, hypersurface. So this integral here is called Comar integral. Comar integral and defines some charges in an asymptotically flat space time. When the space time is not asymptotically flat, there are some issues sometimes. So, yeah, again, just to repeat, this is, as for the electric charge, usually measure, measured at infinity. So we take the two sphere at infinity and we integrate star dk. Okay, let me remind you a couple of notions of uh, what is uh, asymptotically flat. Okay, asymptotically flat, I'll just say in a loose way. We don't need the, really the mathematically rigorous definitions. So an asymptotically flat space-time well, loosely speaking is a space-time that asymptotically once I've introduced a radial coordinate, I can say that I'm at large distance from some point, uh, looks like uh, Minkowski. So we will have this working definition. We don't need anything more. We introduce always some time, radial, t time phi coordinate in, phi, in four dimensions. t time phi are uh, the angles on the two sphere. r is a radial coordinate. So uh, for us, a synthetically flat space is a space that uh, when r goes to infinity, looks like Minkowski. In these coordinates, it's natural to write Minkowski's, the Minkowski matrix in this way. So this is the matrix on the two sphere. This is the cone over the two sphere, which is just R3. So this is the flat matrix on R3, and this is uh, the, the time part of the Minkowski matrix. So then a space time is stationary. If there exists a 
killing vector that is everywhere time-like. We can say that it is asymptotically stationary if the killing vector is time-like asymptotically. And sometimes this is enough for defining the charges. But let's assume the space-time is really stationary. So there exists a killing vector, k, okay, that is every, everywhere time-like. That is time-like. So in some coordinates, some convenient coordinates, it can be written as d over dt. These are adapted coordinates to this killing vector. And uh, we will use this to construct the notion of a mass. I'm going to do this in a second. But before, let's also introduce another killing vector. This refers to axisymmetric space times. So the space-time is axisymmetric if there is e exists another killing vector, k tilde, which generates a U1 isometry. So this must be space-like. We don't want closed time-like curves, of course. And it generates a U1 isometry. So it generates translations along an angular coordinate that for us most of the time will be <coughs> phi, which is identified up to 2 pi. So we have an angle phi identified up to 2 pi. And in adapted coordinates, k is del over del phi. OK, so now we have introduced two nice killing vectors. We construct these charges that are associated to them assuming that the this exists in the space-time, so the space-time is stationary and axisymmetric, then and asymptotically flat. Again, if the space-time is not asymptotically flat, for instance, the notion of mass is more delicate, requires regularization or other definitions. This is, for instance, the case in ADS. But uh, in Minkowski or asymptotically flat space-times, uh, this issue does not arise. The Komar mass is a good definition of mass, one of the possible ones. So as for the electric and magnetic uh, uh, charges, I introduced this limiting procedure. So the Komar mass is defined as the Komar integral associated with the time-like killing vector that I introduced there. So this is the time-like killing vector of this type. The Komar angular momentum, of course, is the other one. Just uh, the normalization here changes for some reason. The reason why the normalizations here are different, so I'm choosing this constant C in a different way, is just matching with the flat space time conventions. Uh, or definitions of mass and angular momentum. I gave some references if you want to check more details. For instance, this is described in some Townsend notes on black holes, but in many other places. Okay, here we assume also that uh, if these are both present, that they commute, they are commuting vectors. The lead derivative of one on the, on the other vanishes. So we are approaching the description of black holes, but uh, let me first introduce some a few other notions. So the notion of a null hypersurface, killing horizon, and then uh, surface gravity. Surface gravity is uh, associated with the Hawking temperature, so will be important <coughs> for the thermodynamics of black holes. So maybe some of you, of you have seen these things many times, some others have not. I think it's good to recap anyway. If, you, if there's something that is not clear, just, just ask and I'll try to expand on this. Is everything okay so far?
So before coming to killing horizons, just let's recall what is a black hole, what is an event horizon. Okay, maybe I'll even write it. So for now, let's consider asymptotically flat space times. Which contains a region uh, that is not in the backward light cone of future time like infinity. This is hard to say, but easy to. to Draw. So let me just. Uh, okay, right. So it is maybe hard to say, but easy to draw. I mean, we have a, what if we didn't have a, this singularity here? This is a one a Penrose diagram. We don't have the singularity here. This is Minkowski space. We have future time like infinity here. Then we have null infinity here. And uh, here, instead, this is the Penrose diagram of a black hole. We have a region, this one. It is not in the backward light cone of future time like infinity. This is future time like infinity. The backward light cone is this. And this region is out of that. The boundary of such region, this one, is the event horizon. Okay. So let's see how we can relate the presence of an event horizon with these killing vectors that we have been playing with. We will see there is a killing vector that becomes null on the event horizon. So to do this, I have to introduce null hypersurfaces before. The horizon will be a null hypersurface. For some killing vector. So first, hypersurface. Okay, a hypersurface can be specified by taking a function of the space-time coordinates, f of x, and saying, okay, I set this to a constant. This gives me a hypersurface. Now a vector v, which is v mu del mu, is tangent to this hypersurface if it satisfies v mu del mu f equals 0. Because uh, del f points uh, to uh, in, uh, in inside the hypersurface. And so if the vector has just components uh, along the left, then it is uh, inside the hypersurface, so it is tangent. Similarly, a one form is uh, normal. So I take a one form. Um, This one form here, that is del mu f x mu, this is normal to sigma. Sigma is my hypersurface sigma. We 
because it vanishes when uh, it eats any tangent vector because of this equation, because uh, the f uh, of a tangent vector is zero, so it's normal. And also we can construct a normal vector, uh, vector, which is normal, is constructed from the one form basically by raising one index. So we have a, a vector C, which is G mu nu D mu F dx del. This is also normal. Again, because it is orthogonal to any tangent vector. If I take a vector that is tangent, that satisfies this, I contract with the xi, is zero, where this v is tangent. OK, now we know what is a hypersurface, a tangent vector, a normal one form, and a normal vector. We can introduce what is a, a null hypersurface. So it will be a hypersurface of this type, sigma, whose uh, normal vector is null. Okay, a null hypersurface is a hypersurface whose normal vector satisfies this equation on the hypersurface. N for null hypersurface. And do you know what is special with this tangent? Uh, I already said that. <laughs> this vector is uh, normal but also tangent yeah. because. If you see, uh, xi is expressed like that. So the contraction of xi with itself, which is 0, is also xi mu d mu f, which is the definition of a tangent vector according to this. So the normal vectors of an null hypersurface have the property of also being tangent. OK, now an ally hypersurface like this one is said uh, to be a killing horizon. So if there is a killing vector xi, that is normal to n. So if there is a killing vector that is normal to n. And in particular, it will be null on n, because we just say that. The null hypersurfaces are such that the, uh, the vectors are, uh, the normal vectors are null. So why we are interested in killing horizons? So far, this is just a name. We have a killing vector xi that is normal to some null hypersurface. But it has been shown that uh, in most cases, very typically, let's say, uh, the event horizons are killing horizons. The opposite is not true. You can find killing horizons in Minkowski space very easily. Uh, maybe try to do that. We, we will find the answer in many textbooks. But uh, 
uh, it is uh, almost always true. It depends a bit on the matter content uh, that you have, but under mild assumptions, that uh, an event horizon is a killing horizon. So the event horizon is actually a null hypersurface, and it admits a normal killing vector. We are interested in finding this killing vector because it will be useful for describing the properties of the black hole. We will see an example in a moment. So far, I'm just introducing some definitions and uh, reminding you, you of a few things. OK, and moreover, since I just said uh, it is, let me maybe schematically write something. So a bit more precisely, although this is not really a theorem, in uh, an axisymmetric stationary asymptotically flat space-time, An event horizon is a killing horizon. And how can I construct the killing vector, the generator of the horizon, this killing vector that becomes null? What can it be? It must be neither time-like nor space-like because it must become null. So it must be a bit of, a, of both. So um, it's a combination of k plus omega k tilde, where k and k tilde are our, our friends of before. An adapted coordinate are a time-like vector and a space-line ve vector that are both um, so since I assume, I'm assuming here that the space-time is axisymmetric, I have uh, this k tilde. It is stationary, I have this k. One is time-like, the other one is space-like. The combination can become null somewhere. And uh, this is what happens if you have an event horizon. So this is almost a theorem. Again, I repeat, it depends on some assumptions. So this we can write. In our coordinates, del t plus omega del phi. What is this omega, in your opinion? Some velocity. Some velocity. We'll see uh, better, but uh, in the example, that this is the angular velocity of the horizon. This is a constant. This is a constant. Omega is a constant. You can see that it is the velocity at which you would end up uh, rotating if you were falling close to the horizon. So you are dragged uh, with this velocity. Del phi over, phi over dt for you that you are close to the horizon is uh, something like omega. So this is called the angular velocity of the horizon itself. It will play some role later on. So I should introduce the surface gravity now. Uh, it's uh, computed starting from this uh, killing vector, generating the horizon. But maybe we can take 5, 10 minutes break, start again at 5, 10, OK? OK, maybe we can start. So we have introduced the killing horizon and the vector that is uh, associated with the killing horizon, which is a null uh, hypersurface. And uh, now we introduce yet another concept. And then we will apply all this, uh, all what we have seen, and we will uh, get to some example that we will use many other times, that is the kern human black hole in 4D. But before that, is there any other question?
So suppose we have a, a killing horizon, and to each killing horizon we can associate this notion of surface gravity. So we have a killing horizon, therefore we have a killing vector that satisfies this equation on the null hypersurface. Okay, this was our definition of the killing horizon. Now we can take the gradient of this. And if we expand, this is normal. This is normal to, to n. This gradient is normal to n, using the definitions that uh, we had. Since it is normal to n, uh, it must be proportional to the killing vector that is normal to the hypersurface. So it is, uh, um, uh, there exists a function kappa, function, such that So do you see this? So this is normal because when I when I act on one of these, the contraction of xi with the del mu xi is zero, as we saw before. This uh, associated with the fact that uh, is sorry, it's, I didn't want to write that. I just wanted to say this. Sorry, I saw some faces were not convinced. So this this can be zero. A priori could be zero, but it's enough that it is uh, proportional to the vector xi. So this satisfies the fact that this is normal to n, because when I contract this with xi, since xi dot xi is zero, I get that uh, the xi contracted with this other vector or one form is zero, so it is normal. So this function kappa is a function a priori is called the surface gravity okay let's uh, expand this this equation a little bit so i can act with the gradient either on the first or the second vector so i get a factor of 2 and then i can use the killing equation to exchange the indices on the covariant derivative and on the killing vector to get this equation, xi nu nabla nu, xi mu equal kappa xi mu. So when I act again here and on this vector and on this vector, I get a factor of two that cancels these two then I have to exchange the indices on the derivative on the vector, or one of the vectors, on the vector that is acted upon by the derivative, and I can, so I get cancel this sign, and I get this equation. Is it uh, OK? Should I go through the details? Just let me know if it's not uh, obvious. Again, this holds on n. So this is the equation that we will need. Um, it's also, you can see, it's also the geodesic equation for the curves generated by this killing vector, xi. The geodesic equation is sometimes expressed as this combination being zero if the curve is finely parameterized. More generally, it is this. So this is the geodesic equation, OK? It is just saying that. Uh, the integral curves of this vector are uh, geodesics. That's fine. And we will also need a for another formula for the surface gravity. Sometimes this is a bit confusing because 
when you apply this to a black hole, you need to use some good coordinate system um, that is non-degenerate at the horizon, because then you want to measure this at the horizon. So if you use the wrong coordinate system, it will be messy, especially because it is a vector equation. So we want to improve the situation a little bit and get a scalar equation. Um, for concrete reasons, if you try to do these computations uh, very concretely, you will see that it helps. And there is a scalar equation that expresses the surface gravity. I think I will leave the proof as an exercise, or we can discuss it if you're interested. It's in the notes. So one can show. Um, So just using the definition and the properties of this vector C, that it is killing and null on the hypersurface, that uh, kappa squared is minus half. You will find it's, uh, it's a few lines, but uh, you will find the solution in the notes when I distribute them. And so this is a formula to extract the surface gravity, this, this thing. You may ask why do I, are we interested in this function? As I said before, this will compute the Hawking temperature. So it's central in black hole thermodynamics. Sorry, the first uh, derivative acts on everything or just on uh, the vector? No like this. Okay. It's the square of this uh, derivative. So this is one property. Another property that we can show, so there will be two properties, but we show just the simplest one. So kappa is constant on the orbits of C. So what I would like to show is that this kappa is constant on the horizon, which is true, but the, the proof is a bit complicated. You can find it in Wald's book, for instance. So this I just state. So this I'm going to prove because it's easy. It's not the same as saying that it is constant over all the horizon, but uh, we will see this. But I state the more general property that kappa is constant over so I recall that uh, since C is also tangent if uh, if i if I accept this, this follows, but the opposite instead is not true uh, because there are vectors that are uh, along the horizon that are not proportional to C. Um, but let's see this one. So suppose I have a tangent vector, V vector tangent to N to my null hypersurface, the killing horizon. Since, uh, uh, So I want to use this formula, and uh, I act on it with the derivative along this tangent vector. Let's see what we get. We have v rho. I take the derivative along this vector, so v rho and rho. I act on kappa squared. And now I express this using this formula here. So I have. Uh, So I have that this nabla can act either on this term or the other term, so it cancels the factor, of, the factor of two. So I just write a sign. I write one time d mu xi nu, and the other time I write d rho nabla mu xi nu, nabla rho nabla mu xi nu. Now recall the killing vectors have that nice property that two covariant derivatives acting on them 
and give the Riemann tensor times the vector itself. So let's use that. So I copy this part. For this other part, I use the property that I get the Riemann tensor. So hopefully I get the indices uh, in the correct order. So this is some identity. Now we here so far, and wait, I have to contract this with Vero. But Vero. So now, since uh, the vector xi, the, ve the killing vector that is null on, uh, on the killing horizon, is also tangent. We saw this before. It's normal, but it's also tangent because it, because it is null. Then we can choose v, this generic tangent vector, to be precisely xi. If we do that, we get xi rho nabla rho kappa squared. And then here, I have to pick, uh, I have to take, okay, let me just write it, nabla mu xi nu minus, and then I have xi rho, xi sigma, r nu mu sig. So what is this? What is this? It is zero because this is symmetric in rho sigma. This is anti-symmetric, so I just have zero. So what we have proven is that uh, the derivative along xi of the surface gravity vanishes. So this means that uh, the surface gravity is constant along uh, the orbits of xi, so along the, in the direction generated by xi. So this was a small proof that I wanted to show, just using all the properties that we introduced. A more elaborated proof can be engineered to show that the kappa, the surface gravity, is constant on the horizon. Does this remind you of something, if you think about thermodynamics of this property? Something is constant. What is constant in thermodynamics? The temperature at equilibrium. The definition of equilibrium, the zero law of thermodynamics, is that temperature is constant. And uh, indeed, later on, we, tomorrow, we will spell out the laws of black holes, make black hole mechanics that are analogous to the laws of thermodynamics. And the zero law will be just that the surface gravity is constant over the horizon, that uh, is parallel to the zero law of thermodynamics, saying that the, ter the temperature is constant uh, at equilibrium. So the horizon somehow is a surface at equilibrium, in thermodynamical equilibrium. So, okay, the, in, uh, in black hole physics, this uh, semi-classical black hole physics, and this uh, surface gravity is interpreted as the working temperature, but this will have to wait until tomorrow. If you are just a general relativist person, you would say that uh, the surface gravity also has some physical meaning. Uh, if you are in an asymptotically flat and static space-time, the surface gravity is the acceleration of an observer that is very close to the horizon, but measured from infinity, because the acceleration close to the horizon, uh, perceived by the observer that is there, is infinite, actually, or goes towards infinite as, as long as it approaches the horizon. Um, but so there is an infinite redshift uh, that uh, compared to the measurement made uh, at infinity, and the two things compensate. So the surface gravity is really the surface, the acceleration that would be measured from infinity for the observer that is infalling into the, into the horizon. For more details, again, you can check the, the standard textbooks like Carroll or Wald. They spend much more time on this. Just a small thing, just to clarify maybe some confusion. You could say, OK, this is a bit confusing because uh, we, we are just trying to attribute some physical meaning to kappa, the surface gravity. But uh, clearly, this depends on the normalization of the vector xi. Uh, if I rescale xi by a constant, 
nothing changes, it's still a null a killing vector, uh, but my surface gravity scales. Like, so C goes into C times C, implies that uh, kappa goes into C times kappa. So indeed, the kappa is not an intrinsic, uh, intrinsically related to the horizon. It's not an intrinsic property of the horizon, but it is a property of the horizon and of this killing vector C. Uh, so we need to specify the normalization to establish somehow some conventions in which to work. And uh, the normalization is that uh, if the space-time is static, then uh, C is basically will be del t, and we define del t to be this, that is, to be normalized, C is k, which is del t in some coordinates. But let me say this. C is just k, the time-like killing vector, and uh, we say that k dot k is minus 1 at infinity. So we normalize k at infinity, this we can do, we fix this constant c, and then kappa will be what it is. We have fixed the normalization at infinity. If the space-time is uh, uh, stationary, then we discussed before that c is k plus omega k tilde, so where k is time-like and k tilde is uh, space-like uh, out of the horizon. And uh, again, we can do the same. If we fix the normalization of k, the time-like vector at infinity, then we are also fixing this, the normalization of xi, and uh, we specify the surface gravity. So there is some ambiguity, but we can fix it and work with that. OK, so this ends. So far, we can keep the surface gravity there. It will come back when we discuss um, tomorrow the first law of black hole the thermodynamics. And uh, I already stated the zeroth law. And uh, let's uh, go on and see uh, some properties uh, of, um, of um, a, an asymptotically flat stationary like in matrix space-time. I'm going towards defining this example of the Kern-Newman black hole, which is a black hole that has electric charge, angular momentum, mass, a bit of everything. Um, but before getting there, let's see something more general that uh, applies more generally. It is a relation between these properties and the area. Suddenly the area comes out. This formula, I, so I'm now going to discuss a formula that relates these conserved charges that we have seen so far. Uh, the surface gravity will also appear. And this is the generalized SMAR formula. So let me first write it, and then uh, we are going to discuss how it arises. So SMAR proved it for the Kerr black hole, but it can be generalized. Uh, no, I'll write it later because it's a, bit, it's a bit long. Let me write what SMAR proved the, for the Kerr black hole. For the Kerr black hole, this is uh, the formula. So if you see this, it's already quite inspiring if you think about what we are going, uh, what we are heading at. Um, so we have the surface gravity here. It's the temperature. We have the area. It's the entropy, so temperature times entropy. Then we have some angular velocity and some angular momentum. So these are things that appear in all the thermodynamic laws, in first law, in... Uh, yeah, in the first law, or in the partition functions that define, you know, when you pass from one partition function to the other, in grand canon, to the different statistical ensembles, you always have combinations of this type of some potential times uh, a charge. And if you also have uh, an electrostatic potential, so this we will see in one example very soon. Um, so suppose this is an electrostatic potential. 
electric. You have something similar to this. An electric static potential times uh, uh, the charge. So I defined the electric charge before. If we use that definition, we will see we will see this. So this applies not to Kerr, but to, to for instance, Reisner Nostrum or to the Kerr Newman black hole that we are going to introduce. Um, if you have matter outside the black hole, so if you don't have just electromagnetic field or empty space, then there are some corrections <coughs> due to the energy momentum tensor of the matter that we are going to, to, to see now a bit quickly maybe because I would also like to discuss the Kerr Newman example so that tomorrow we are more ready to go ahead. So, um, so this formula, this generalization, so here I'm just writing again the SMAR plus this other piece that is uh, in the presence of electromagnetic field. And I'm going to generalize this formula. That's why it is called generalized. And this was done in 73, actually, by Bardeen, Carter, and Hawking in the paper that established the laws of black hole mechanics. There, they were still thinking that it's not really thermodynamics because there is not really a temperature. But then Hawking himself, two years later, proved that uh, there is a tem an actual temperature, actual radiation. And therefore, the black hole laws of black hole mechanics became the law laws of black hole thermodynamics. This we will see uh, tomorrow. Let's stick to this. Uh, to what we have seen so far. I need some space, maybe. Okay, let's start here. Very good. I'm going precisely to use those definitions and extract this formula. Uh, just bear with me. So, suppose we have a killing horizon. So, we have this killing vector C, the same we saw there. So Xi, I want to express as the time-like killing vector associated with uh, time translations plus omega. Now I'm adding this H just to say it's the velocity of the horizon. Sometimes I will omit that. K tilde. So we said, in general, the vector that becomes null, killing vector that becomes null at the horizon is of this form. And let's compute the charge, the coma integral, as it was just uh, uh, said, associated with this. So we compute the charge of Xi. So I take this normalization, like for the, like for the mass. So we measure this on the two-sphere at infinity. So again, we take a, a finite r, and then we send r to infinity. Let me just write as 2 infinity. Star d xi, definition of the Comar integral. This gives us a conserved charge. And then we just expand uh, the expression for xi. is minus 1 over 8 pi, the integral of star dk minus omega h over 8 pi, integral star dk tilde. All the integrals are on the two-sphere at infinity. So this is the mass, because this was the mass, right? This is omega h goes out of the integral, because I said before it's constant. I haven't proven this, but it, it is. So omega goes out of the integral. And then we have j. This is, was the definition of j. But recall there was a. There was a, 16, uh, a factor of 16. There was a, a factor of minus 1 half relative to, one to this. So this is uh, minus 2j in my definition. I hope I'm not messing it up, but it seems correct. So this is what we get from this. It's just a combination of mass and angular momentum. Nothing surprising. But now we want to relate this to something that is happening at the horizon. Now, here we are at infinity. We are measuring everything at infinity. But we want to relate this via the Stokes theorem to something happening at the horizon, because we want to uh, relate this to the area. So in order to measure the area, it must be at the horizon. Right? So we will use Stokes to do that. So let's choose a wise space-like hypersurface, sigma. 
let me keep it there. So QC is um, QC is M minus 2 omega j. This we have computed. We leave it there. Then we do another computation of QC. We take this hypersurface, sigma, that is space-like. And uh, at infinity, it tends on the two sphere at infinity. And uh, on the horizon, here suppose it intersects the horizon, it, it intersects uh, uh, a two sphere on the horizon. So here we have the horizon. So everything is space-like. And now we want to use Stokes' theorem. Recall that by Stokes' theorem, we can relate uh, the integral on some boundary to the integral of the other boundary of some bulk surf surface, hypersurface. And so let's do that. So I want to compute again QC, which is minus 1 over 8 pi integral of so QC is defined as the integral over the two sphere at infinity. But now I use Stokes here. So I can relate that to the integral over the two sphere at the horizon. And then I have the term that um, contains the integral over the wall sigma. OK, this is just Stokes. And now let's express this. So this, I copy the first term, minus 1 over 8 pi, integral S2H star dxc. And then this, recall we have a, a killing vector. This is related to the, to the star of the current that I introduced before that was constructed using the energy momentum tensor. So before we had a killing vector, and in the proof of the, in the definition of the Comar integral, we introduced this current here. If you go back and see the definition, apply this to four space-time dimensions. Uh, so that the signs uh, come out uh, correct, you get this. So the energy momentum tensor appears because it's contained in this current. This uses the Einstein equation to re-express something that is the Ricci tensor coming out of this expression and relates the Ricci tensor to the energy momentum tensor of the space-time, uh, of the matter that is in the space-time. So here I, I like to use the differential form notation in order not to introduce the, the normals uh, to the hypersurface, but this just means something like the normal to the uh, hypersurface. So, okay. So this is the energy momentum tensor of, that appears on the right-hand side of the Einstein equation. So of the matter fields and whatever fields, radiation we have in, uh, in the system. So it can be anything. That's why this, this term is what generalizes the SMAR formula, is the extra term that was introduced by Bardeen, Carter, and Hawking, because they were considering matter uh, you know, um, around uh, black holes, for instance, or just pure matter as well. So in a sense, this is the contribution of the matter outside the black hole. And if there is an horizon, there is, if there is a black hole, this is the contribution of the black hole that will give the area times kappa. We are not there yet. I'm sure I will erase the equation that I need. Uh, let's see. So we want to treat this integral here. The other one is what it is. We remain like that. We need to treat this. We want to extract the area. So this requires some gymnastic with uh, normals and uh, volumes. Let, 
let me just write uh, an equation. The volume over this, of these two spheres at the horizon can be expressed in this way, star n wedge xi, where xi is the one form that we have been playing so far, so it is normal to the horizon. n is another normal. n is a normal one form. Again, normal to the horizon. Just a second. Uh, that I normalize so that it is independent uh, of xi with uh, <coughs> such that n times xi is minus 1. Uh, let me just check if uh, everything, yeah. So n wedge xi is a two form that is completely normal to the horizon. I take the odd star and I get the rest of the volume form of the 4D space time that is the volume form on the two sphere. So normal to the horizon, n is normal, I say it maybe in a better way, is normal to the horizon, n is normal to this two sphere. So n wedge c is completely uh, pointing uh, uh, normally, to orthogonally to the, to the two sphere. I take the odd star and I get the volume form. So this is one way of expressing the volume form. Was there a question? Yeah. Right. I mean, and the no, the boundary sigma is not in the horizon. Sigma intersects the horizon. Sigma is a space-like hypersurface that extends from the horizon, say, to infinity, and it is space-like. So I could draw the, the conformal diagram somehow here and uh, make sure that this is space-like. The horizon is, uh, was something like that in the conformal diagram. Suppose I, this is embedded. So this reaches space-like infinity, which is here. Right? This is space-like infinity. It goes here. The horizon is uh, this uh, diagonal, and uh, this other hypersurface is on the horizon. And the space-like connects the two in the Penrose diagram. I don't know if it's sufficiently clear, but I guess it makes sense. But this also makes sense. So since, since we have to integrate over the two sphere, we need to take this form, star dxi, which is a two form. It is defined uh, everywhere in space time, but we need to project it on the two sphere at the horizon in order to then integrate. So first we need to project and then we integrate. That's how the, this integral is defined. So since this is the volume, the projector can be written as vol S2H. So this is a two form defined like this, it times vol S2H. So this takes, this acts on a two form. It contracts it with the indices along the horizon. So it projects on the horizon, then multiplies the, by the volume. So it's like a projector on the horizon. So I can do this first, act on star dxc. Mm -hmm. So this projects star dxi on the two sphere at the horizon on S2H. And then I can take the integral. So I'm, I'm computing this. The minus 1 over 8 pi will be added later. So I'm computing this. So this is the same as that modulo, the minus 1 over 8 pi. So now... Uh, I don't have the time to prove this in full detail. Maybe try to do this. So now this is given here, right? So there, is, there are some odd stars to take care of. There you have this one, this other one. You contract with the epsilon. That you have two epsilons. They get contracted like this. Uh, no, no, rho prime, sigma prime. So you use the formula that I gave before. I don't really have the time to do the details of this, but. Uh, if something is not clear, we can discuss. So if you do this, gymnastic, you will get that, uh, so this is star dxi. We get two times, two times because of the combinatorial factor in the epsilons. Um, the integral over vol as 2h and nu xi nu nabla nu. Xi nu, you get this after 
playing with the odd stars and using this definition here. Now, this, what is this? Surface gravity, so we have kappa xi nu. Kappa, I just declare it's a constant over the two sphere, it goes out. So we are left with two times um, kappa. Then I have n contracting, contracting xi, but we declare that this is normalized in this way. So we have a minus. And after this has been uh, done, I just have the integral over the volume of these two sphere, which is the area of the horizon. OK, so this was the, what I've computed is star d xi on S2H. This is what we have computed here, which is a bit of this q xi. If we put everything together, using we equate this to that, we obtain a formula that uh, has m minus 2 omega h uh, j equal minus 2 kappa a plus this term here. I put everything together, then I, I let you stare at that. So I have m from up there. I move 2 omega h j on the other side. Then we had um, minus 2 kappa a, but we had minus 1 over 8 pi. So it's equal to 1 over 4 pi uh, kappa a. And this is what I wrote before. And then we have this extra contribution from the energy momentum tensor of the extra matter that we may have. And this comes, goes here. OK, and this is the generalized SMART formula that we will use. It will be useful to prove the first law um, of black hole thermodynamics. Sorry, here I, I did something wrong. There is a, a plus, yes. And uh, I'm not introducing the electric charge. This I leave as an exercise. Try to introduce, suppose you are in Einstein-Maxwell theory, I introduce the electric charge. I, I, I'd rather go on with the Kern-Newman black hole. Let me just say that suppose, suppose you have a, an electric magnetic field. Take the Einstein, uh, I'm going to define this action in a second. So this is, will be the Lagrangian. Um, so uh, this has an energy momentum tensor. You compute the energy momentum tensor. You plug it in here. So this will give a contribution to, to this expression. And then you define the electrostatic potential at the horizon as minus the contraction of, again, our friend, the killing vector generating the horizon with the gauge potential at the horizon. So this is phi h, you define it like that, is the electrostatic potential measured with respect to uh, where the zero is put at infinity. If you do that, then you will see that this term gives an extra contribution that is uh, phi h times q that I draw, uh, wrote before. So if the matter, if the, the contribution of the energy momentum tensor comes from the electromagnetic field, that's the extra contribution that you get in the SMAR, uh, generalized SMAR formula. So part of this was also derived by Bekenstein in uh, the early papers on uh, black hole entropy. So in the remaining 10 minutes, we apply all this uh, to the Kerr-Newman solution. It will be, I, it's a bit complicated, it has many terms, but I want to write it once, and then we will take various limits and use this, the various limits in the course of the lectures. So I will not write again the matrix all the time. I write the general one, and then we take the uncharged or uh, non-rotating case uh, when, when it is convenient.
So I introduced the Kern Newman solution as an example. We want to work with some example. I have a Mathematica file with all the checks of what I'm going to say. You are encouraged to also create your own file. If you really want, we can compare and see. So S is, so, sorry, I keep S for the entropy that will appear later on. I write the action with an I. So this is Einstein-Maxwell in four space-time dimensions without cosmological constant. So it's just uh, Einstein-Maxwell. The normalization here is the one that is normally used in, in general relativity. OK, of course, f uh, is dA. And uh, uh, the Einstein and Maxwell equations, OK, you can derive them. So one can show that the most general uh, stationary black hole solution to this theory, and not only to this theory, you can also add some matter, but then there are assumptions on the matter that you add. But for this theory, the most general stationary black hole is the Kern-Newman solution. So I'll write the matrix, the full matrix. And the full solution here, it's uh, also in the notes. Uh, if you don't really need to write it. But uh, then the other lectures, I will not write the matrix again. I will always refer to this. So hopefully, let me write it properly once. So we have a matrix. So uh, before just writing, um, the Schwarzschild solution is static. So it has SO3 symmetry, of course. Uh, this one is not static. It's rotating like Kerr. So it has uh, the symmetry along uh, d phi. It has the symmetry along dt. But then theta will appear here and there. There will be functions of theta because we don't have SO3 symmetry, of course. Just wanted to specify to make it more clear the why various many terms appear. So if you're familiar with Kerr, this is similar to Kerr, but uh, it's more similar to Kerr in a sense than to Reisner Nordstrom. So this is the matrix here. This is the matrix. Sigma is a function defined here. Delta is a function of R here. And then there are parameters. We have uh, m, a, p, and q. And I also have to write the gauge field for you. Okay, this is the gauge field. And so Q controls the DT term and uh, controls the electric charge. P will control the magnetic charge. Actually, you can show using the coma integrals, or well, the definitions of electric magnetic charge, that Q and P are precisely the electric and magnetic charge according to the definition that we gave. 
You can also show using the Comari integral for the mass for the vector dt, killing vector dt, that m appearing in the matrix is uh, the mass, the Comar mass. m is m Comar. And uh, j, um, sorry, j Comar. The angular momentum, what is the angular momentum? What can it be? So M is the mass. P and Q are the magnetic and electric charge. There is one parameter that remains. A. It's A times M uh, is uh, J comma. If you take the vector D phi, you apply the definition of the comma integral, this is what you get for the angular momentum. So if A is zero, if A is zero, we get uh, Reisner Nostrum. Right. If A is zero, we get Reisner Nostrum with uh, both dionically charged, both electric and magnetic charge. So A is zero is Reisner Nostrum. Sometimes we will play with this because it's simpler because A equals zero kills many terms. Then uh, P equal Q equal zero is care. Just uh, rotation remains. And then we can take everything to zero, and this will be Schwarzschild. OK, I, um, I guess I have to stop. I have something more to say, but I will go on tomorrow. So I am afraid tomorrow I will have to rewrite this. Um, but I don't want to take too much of your time. So tomorrow we will see that uh, not only we can define the Comari integrals and obtain the charges, as I just said, but uh, we can also introduce and compute. Uh, I will give you the results, but you're encouraged to check this with Mathematica. We can, uh, we can compute uh, the angular velocity. Also the electric potential, the area, the surface gravity, and we will verify the SMAR formula. I will give some, I will, I will not really compute everything, but just give some steps. We will verify that the SMAR formula holds, and then we will identify, so what is the killing vector that becomes null, so we will specify what is this. And, uh, and then we will use this many other times later on uh, when we need to make some examples. So this is all for now, unless there are questions. Yes? The electric coupling? What do you mean? Maybe I don't get the... It does? Ah, okay, I can rescale F uh, as I want. Here I don't have other, I don't have anything that is charged. If I have had any, something else that was charged, like a, a scalar field that is charged under, under the gauge field, I would need to specify the relative normalization of the two. Here, I just have F, nothing is charged. The Riemann tensor, the metric is certainly not charged. I can rescale F as I like. ADS, no? A is a parameter. No, sorry, the gauge field. The gauge field is, uh, is uh, where? Well, up there. It's uh, the gauge field that I have to stick in to solve the Maxwell and Einstein equations. It, it's the solution. It's the solution of the equation. Yeah, I, from the action, I derive the Einstein and Maxwell equations, and I have to choose Modulo gauge transformation, of course, up, up to gauge transformations, the gauge field is fixed uh, as is appearing up there. Okay, I guess it's time to stop and we'll continue tomorrow.